what you see is the current economic situation in India right now, especially over the last uh, four years, or five years of the yeah, Modi government. So how much would you see this as something the Modi government has actually pushed further versus something that has been part of the larger framework for the last 20 years? You see, that's interesting because between 2004, 5 and 2013, 14, you had a 10-year period when, in which the first four years were characterized by rapid economic growth. You know, the World Bank has put out a document where the Modi government has been quoting all the time the ease of business index, mm -hmm. but is not quoting the rest of the document, mm -hmm. which actually shows that, uh, you know, post-2009, there was a slowdown, mm -hmm. global economic crisis and so on. And what you're finding in terms of the reported growth rates post-2013-14 is really a recovery from the crisis growth of the post-2008 oh. global economic crisis. And even those numbers, if you uh, measure them, if you back end the series, you go back to earlier ways of me measuring GDP, the growth rates would not be very different. Right. So what the Modi regime has done is to lose an opportunity of not just improving growth rates, but having a much more broad-based economic growth right. post-2013-14 right. in an especially favorable international context. Right. For about two and a half years to the Modi regime, international oil prices fell very sharply. This would have been the occasion for you to give the economy a big boost. You didn't do this. Now what do you have? You have two or three things working against you because I, I mentioned unemployment and agrarian crisis, but I did not mention the balance of payments issue. You'll remember that way back in 2013, when the UPA government's second version was in office, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the sharp rise in the price of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis the rupee. In fact, it went from 45 to 63 in a fairly short period. One dollar became 63 rupees rather than 45. And they were saying, oh, it'll go to 65 and 70, and this is all terrible Congress, UPA, mismanagement of the economy. Fact was that, you know, it was a, you were declining in growth rates, you were post the global economic crisis, and of course you also had been doing trade liberalization. So one element of continuity since the liberalization policies came into force in the early 90s and got further intensified is that throughout this period, there has not been a single quarter mind you, three-month period, during which the merchandise trade deficit, how is that defined? It is the value of exports of physical goods minus the value of imports of physical goods. This is the merchandise trade deficit. That has been consistently in the red. India's merchandise trade balance has been always in the red, meaning that your exports have never financed your imports of goods. Right. So how do we survive? One part of the survival mechanism comes from net exports of services, IT, IT-enabled services, tourism, these may give you a bit of a help. The second, more important element is the remittances of Indian working people abroad, right. which comes not only from software professionals, which is of course more easily recognized, but from very hardworking people from all parts of the country, from rural areas who go and work in very difficult conditions in difficult countries. Right. Uh, you know, foregoing their civil liberties, sending money home to their families, working long hours, whose efforts are never recognized. They, have, they are the major sources of foreign exchange for you beyond your IT, IT-enabled export uh, services. So together, these two flows of income into India, of foreign exchange into India, both from remittances and from net exports of services, they've helped shore up a little bit your large deficit on the merchandise state. 2013, the merchandise trade deficit touched about 10.4%. It was huge, really big. And uh, was brought down to about 6% by these remittances and so on. But at the end of the day, throughout this period, we have had a persistent current account deficit. There will be one or two exceptions will be there. But by and large, we had a current account deficit, which is basically the merchandise trade deficit, then showed up a little bit by uh, remittances and by uh, net export of services. This deficit, current account deficit, compels you desperately seek foreign capital inflows, right. regardless of whether they come for productive purposes or unproductive purposes. So you're desperate, for example, to attract portfolio investment, which contributes zero to the economy, goes into the stock market, goes into the commodity markets, speculates, makes money, and leaves. Right. But you don't mind, because you want it to keep coming. You're so desperate in every quarter for your you know, overall forex deficit that, in a sense, the Modi regime has taken this forward and despite doing all that and despite a very significant segment of the rule which was favorable to them in terms of oil prices, they have now got us to a point where the rupee has now moved from 63 
or 64 rupees to something like 72 rupees. Right. Now, why, why, what is happening? Two things are happening. One is that the easy money policies in the advanced countries has been reversed recently, especially in the US Fed, which has been raising interest rates. Now, the US Fed interest rates are close to about 3.5% or 3% thereabouts. So, this is causing an outflow of finance capital from emerging market economies, including India. Uh, second, in the more recent period, there's been this big trade war right. with Trump and China. targeting China and so on. And uh, uh, of course, the Chinese can handle it. You see, for all, contrary to all the media reports that are appearing saying that Chinese economic growth is now uh, slowed down this year and we will be the fastest growing, all this breast beating about our being the fastest growing economy. Really, the Chinese have actually deliberately slowed down their economy a bit because they are worried about credit issues, they're worried about he overheating of the economy. But 6.4% growth rate over about 45 years is in peanuts. Right. It is phenomenal. I mean, people don't recognize this. It's China is another planet. We are another planet. Although Raghuram Rajan has said more recently, I'm very surprised to see it. He said, oh, eventually India will overtake China. We have got larger numbers. So in absolute GDP, we may overtake them. But per capita GDP, what's going to happen to you? Yeah. In any event, we are not doing a running race between China and India. We're looking at what is happening to Indian people working Indian working people under the regime. And I, I would have to say that we lost a golden opportunity to rejig the economy, to help create mass employment, provide a boost for the domestic market. And instead, we squandered that period of you know, low oil prices. We did not reduce our dependence on imports of oil. We did not build infrastructure. And you know, I've not even referred so far to the mess in the financial sector. Uh, that's coming, you see. <laughs> if you're trying to address any of these issues, the problem we have is that you've got this large infrastructure investments for which loans were taken by private corporate entities. Look at the absurdity of this. You have a f notion of a fiscal deficit target. You have, a, you have a legislation, okay, FRBM Act. It says the governments should not treat borrowing as legitimate income. Your entire corporate sector invests by borrowing from publicly owned banks. That's okay somehow. They're totally unaccountable to the population, but that's okay. A government accountable to the people cannot borrow, or it is legi not legitimate. This is the political economy of the whole notion of the fiscal deficit. Leave that aside. I mean, even if for argument's sake, you were to say, okay, fiscal deficit may not have a big impact on interest rates or inflation. I'm willing to agree with you on that, but since international investors are made to look at fiscal deficits by rating agencies like, you know, uh, all your Modi and Poor's or whatever, Standard and Poor's, Modi's or Fitch or whoever, these rating agencies tell investors, don't go to country X because it's got a high fiscal deficit. So maybe there is a compelling necessity for you to keep your fiscal deficits down in the current global environment where you allowed footloose finance capital to enter and exit freely across the world. So that may be a compulsion, even if theory doesn't demand right. that you address fiscal deficits. Question is, all right, after all, the fiscal deficit is the difference between two terms, right? Expenditure and revenues. Why can't you tackle the fiscal deficit target through better resource mobilization than only through expenditure reduction? Why are you doing only expenditure reduction? Why? Well, you know, you this is a brilliant ideological uh, uh, feat that the neoliberals have achieved by calling whatever goes to working people as subsidy and calling whatever goes to the corporate says incentive. So if you provide food grains in the PDS, if you provide some subsidies on transport, these are all subsidies. That's a bad word, right? On energy, on food, on fertilizer. You're providing subsidies. It sounds awful. You know, and the World Bank laments that in one year it became 2% of GDP. What you're not saying is that you're providing huge tax concessions, right. explicit and implicit, through all kinds of exemptions and through outright uh, you know, uh, cond condoling of tax not being paid. Uh, we have a finance minister, well, not today. Uh, we had a finance minister two days ago. He might be a different minister with our portfolio right now, but who keeps on talking about tax terrorism. He's saying that, you know, even to demand that corporates pay their taxes is tax terrorism. You had a corporate sector which has been pampered. Uh, you had a foreign capital sector which has been pampered in the hope that they will bring in money here. And the narrative in 1991, was that if you open up the economy, if you remove all controls and regulations, if you allow more space for the private sector, then everything will be fine and dandy, investment will flow in. We learned the hard way that it was not enough to open up. You have to offer them concessions as well. 
Once you offer the foreign capitalist concession, you have to offer it to domestic capitalists. So your budget takes a hit. So where do you squeeze? You squeeze the people. Cut back on education, cut back on health care. This is neoliberalism. We are currently harvesting the wages of neoliberalism. But the only difference is that at least in the UPA 2 regime, UPA 1 regime particularly, left for support, one could push through some popular pro-people schemes. Right. We had the uh, Employment Guarantee Act coming in at the time. We had the uh, uh, Forest Rights Act coming at the time. We had the National uh, Food Security Bill discussions going on for a number of years. But in the current regime, there's been merciless application of neoliberal principles and a complete disregard for the suffering that has caused to various sections of our working people. So currently we face, in addition to the unemployment and agrarian crisis, we face a crisis on the balance of payments. Mm -hmm. So what is happening is that you are not able to increase your exports. What is this, all this thing about make in India about? You know, the idea was that you would produce in India and you would export to global. What you had instead is a fake in India. And then, it, then with demonetization, it became Q in India. So you really had this, all these words that have been thrown around, but effectively on the ground, I'm afraid, the, the track record of the Modi government is not something that even the Modi government can be proud of. So, uh, considering that the government has lost a series of elections recently, do you think that there's a possibility of them trying to bring in some uh, last-minute measures which may seem like uh, pro-people? Yeah, you know, they may do something dramatic, on uh, dramatic meaning dramatic in the, in the newspaper sense. Uh, not in terms of the current content and impact on the ground, on let's say uh, agriculture, for example, loans. Mm -hmm. Or they might also do something on small and medium industries. There's recent business about within dispersing the loan within one, what, 24 hours or something. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these gimmicks have been already out, put out there. But they're also constrained, you see. They, it is difficult for them to do a whole lot of that because they're also determined to uh, keep the fiscal deficit within. However, as the CAG pointed out recently, uh, the one feature of the Modi government for the last four or five years is that they have done a lot of their borrowing off budget. They've concealed their borrowing off budget so that the budget figures look fine, but a lot of borrowing takes place through state entities which are not part of your budget. This, is a, this has been done earlier also. It's not peculiar to the Modi regime, but the Modi regime has put a lot of the money that they've borrowed off budget. And uh, that will come back Chickens coming back through. In fact, your debt has increased by 50% yeah. in the Modi regime period to 82 lakh crores or something. But more important is the other side of it, which is the private sector is also heavily in debt. It's not just the government which is in debt. Private sector owes a lot of money to your banking system. Right. And they have shown no inclination to pay it. And the government has no, shown no inclination to make them pay it. So you are really sitting, why did this happen? I mean, the important question to ask is why did this happen? A, a good part of the crisis in the banking system and the likely uh, defaulting of large corporate entities uh, on their loans to public sector that they have taken from public sector banks, is a lot of it went into infrastructure. Now, traditionally, post-independence, we dealt with it through long-term development finance institutions. We had the IDBI, the ICICI, all of which have become private sector institutions. I mean, it's ridiculous. Your IDBI, Indian National Development Bank of India, ICICI, Industrial Credit Investment Corporation of India, IFCA, Indian uh, Finance Corporation of India, Industrial Finance Corporation of India, whole UTI, you, know, you name it, you had a whole lot, LIC, a whole lot of large, long-term lending agencies in the public sector because you were focused on development banking. Right. But in the 90s, you moved into a regime of universal banking. What are the people who, who, were, who welcomed it at that time, who had also been RBI governor, someone like Rangarajan, I subsequently said that maybe we made a mistake in going in for universal banking. Now, if we had retained development finance institutions, some of this borrowing would have taken place on better terms and would have been taken by publicly held entities, which would be more accountable to repaying their debts. So currently, we have actually, uh, unfortunately, got ourselves into a mess. And uh, given the government's attitude, which is basically save the private sector, never mind about the public sector, we are really uh, doing serious harm to the long-term prospects of Indian economy. That's what worries me a lot. Yeah. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching Newsclip.